All right, so five forms of euthanasia. The first form that uh, I'm going to discuss is known as active euthanasia. All right, active euthanasia is the first form that I'll discuss. Um, and uh, active euthanasia is technically known as the active acceleration of death. The active acceleration of death. Acceleration of... Alright. So active euthanasia is the active acceleration of death. Alright. So the question is, well, what would be an example of active euthanasia? Well, an example of active euthanasia might be um, a medical care provider, um, and actually you can't, you can't technically uh, do this, but um, at least in the States you can't. I, um, a medical care provider concocting a serum of, you know, whatever it might be, um, and injecting it into, the deliberately, injecting it into the veins of the patient or giving the patient uh, uh, some gas or whatever it might be to expedite the process of death so that the um, person from the medical community, the family member, whoever the person is, actively participates in the killing of another person. Right? It's not considered euthanasia, uh, I mean it's not considered murder because of the role of either the health care provider or the loved one um, acting in accord with this individual. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that because it gets a little bit tricky. And then I'll, I'll see, you'll see in a second how this ties to the other aspect. But just, it's very basic. Active euthanasia is the um, attempt to accelerate death um, of a loved one or a patient, um, knowing full well that my participation in the act will expedite the process of the other person dying. That's active euthanasia. Obviously the, the next part or the next uh, form of euthanasia is what's known as passive euthanasia. Alright, so the next form is known as passive euthanasia. And um, this is technically called or known as allowing, allowing someone to die allowing to die, right? You allow the individual to die, and it is the, it is withholding, the results from withholding medical intervention. So that in the U.S., um, and I think there might be an exception, I think there might be, I'm going to say it's Oregon, uh, I don't know, I don't know for certain, but I think everywhere in the U.S., with maybe the exception of maybe one state, active euthanasia is illegal. A medical community uh, and medical care providers cannot actively participate in the killing of patients because it's a violation of the Hippocratic Oath, so on and so forth. But passive euthanasia is allowed in the states, right? So if you have a loved one um, and that person is being, life is being sustained by a feeding tube or um, a breathing, um, uh, breathing instrument, then Withholding that medical inf uh, medical um, intervention, removing that means of sustenance, will obviously allow the person to go into a state that they would normally have, which is death. Right. So that it's not that I'm causing the individual to die directly; it's that the individual dies indirectly. All that I've technically done is I've stopped the sustenance of um, whatever medical piece of equipment was sustaining the individual's life and the individual is then allowed uh, to die. This is, this is um, perfectly legal um, in the States. This one, not. But it is, it is legal uh, in other parts, of, uh, other parts of the world, especially in Europe. Okay, um, before I go on into it, if this were like a full-blown class, I would refer to um, text. I forget who the author was who wrote it. And if any of you watch this in Hatton, to know a bit more about this, you can, in the comments, tell me who the name of the author was, because I don't remember the author's name. But I, uh, and I don't have my, my medical ethics book with me, but I read this phenomenal essay on um, active euthanasia and should we allow patients to actively die, and it's sort of like a seminal text. I should know the author's name, but it, it, it escapes me at the time. 
Um, and the argument was this. Um, the argument was that in the 70s, it's, the practice is now illegal, but in the 70s, it used to be the case that if your child was born with a very specific set of complications, and it's two complications in one, you complicate, you know, the child has um, intestinal blockage at birth, right? The child had intestinal blockage, but also had Down syndrome, right? Um, the parent was given the option of allowing the child to die, right? Now, if the child was born with only intestinal blockage, not accompanied by Down syndrome, the option to allow to die never was presented on the table, right? You know, we, you, know you, you perform a minor um, uh, surgery on the child, um, you remove the blockage, stitch the kid up, kid's on the way. If the child had Down syndrome, however, what, was able to, what the, the parent had the opportunity at the time to do was to say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to allow the kid to die because of the intestinal blockage. Really and truly what ended up happening and what was so motivating about the article, and I, and I apologize for not having, and I should have prepared, but I sort of do these at whim. Um, I really should have the, uh, the author's name in the text, but just put in like intestinal blockage, Down syndrome, passive euthanasia, and I'm sure the author's name will come up who wrote, the, uh, who wrote this, this um, piece that I'm referring to. What really was going on is that there was this implicit understanding that we didn't want the child because the child actually had Down syndrome. It had nothing to do with the fact that there was an intestinal blockage because in cases where there were otherwise normal children um, with just intestinal blockage, the intestinal blockage was removed. When it was a child who had intestinal blockage um, followed by or accompanied with Down syndrome, the child was allowed to die. So I think the guy who was an MD who, who wrote it or he referenced the MD, and he said that um, you really need to think about what it means to allow someone to dehydrate or die of starvation, right? So if you pull a feeding tube, if you pull water, um, what does it really mean for that individual to, to die in this sense of a passive act of euthanasia? And is this act of passive euthanasia actually better than actively taking the person's life? And the whole point of the article was to suggest that active euthanasia is a better, more, um, a better, morally acceptable um, position on euthanasia than passive euthanasia. It wasn't that he was condemning passive euthanasia, but what he wanted to show is that we use the word passive um, and we think that because the, we're not directly facilitating in the act of killing the individual, we're just simply withholding medical services or medical equipment um, that we allow the person to die and that is true however the complication is that you know dehydration takes a very long time and he went into detail about how fungus started to form on the body and just really really very extremely grotesque very graphic um, description of how individuals die in a passive act of euthanasia right it's not always uh, a very quiet very peaceful transition um, into death Sometimes um, the argument was that it's, it's very graphic uh, and, it's, and it's obviously painful psychologically for those who have to witness the death um, and um, hopefully not painful for the individual because there's you know, hopefully uh, some type of pain relief that's given. The argument then is active euthanasia might be a better, um, might be a better approach to euthanasia because instead of allowing this individual to die, right, and he wasn't arguing that the child with Down syndrome and the intestinal blockage should be actively euthanized. He was saying, his argument was that the child with the intestinal blockage and um, Down syndrome should have the intestinal blockage removed, right, that was his argument. Um, but the argument is, I, I, I watched someone wean away over the course of a day, or maybe even two days, depending on how severe the case is and the complications are, or and in that, in that process, watch the body degrade and watch them suffer and the psychological trauma it causes to their family. Or actively implement um, methods in which, in, in a set of ethical criteria in which medical practitioners can um, legally and obviously morally um, actively assist in taking someone's life, right? Because there is too much pain, there is too much suffering. Um, and rather than go through this whole process of waiting or allowing to die, expedite the process.